We are now moving on to mycology, the branch of biology which involves studying fungi. Fungi are non-motile organisms that can form hyphae or spores. They grow in saprorods agar, and their membranes contain ergosterol and chitin. Remember that fungal membranes contain ergosterol, which is the target of many antifungal drugs. These drugs are safe to use in humans because our cells do not contain ergosterol. Fungi exist in two forms, yeast and molds, and can be found in either life form depending on the temperature at which they are growing. In this mycology section, we have divided fungi into three categories. Systemic, for fungi that cause disease in several organs, cutaneous, for fungi that cause disease of the skin, and opportunistic, fungi that cause disease only in those who are immunocompromised. Let's start with the systemic fungi. Within this category, there are four fungi that you should know. Histoplasma, Blastomyces, Coccidioides, and Paracoccidioides. They are unique because each one is endemic to a specific geographical location, shown here on this map. We'll go over these as we cover each type of fungus. Remember these locations, as oftentimes question stems will give away which fungal infection a patient has, simply by telling you what state or country a patient is from or has visited. Also pay attention to the characteristic shapes that distinguish each of the fungi, which we will show you additional pictures of. There are some general things you should know which all four of these fungi have in common. For example, all four fungi are dimorphic, meaning that they can exist in two different forms depending on the temperature. At cold temperatures, or 20 degrees Celsius, they exist as molds, while at hotter temperatures of 37 degrees Celsius, they exist in yeast form. Therefore, when we take biopsies of areas infected by these fungi, we will be looking for their yeast forms because they have been growing at body temperature. The only exception is coccidioides, which exists as a spheral at body temperature. They all cause pneumonia, which can mimic tuberculosis by forming granulomas within the lungs. Remember, however, that there is no person-to-person -person transmission of these fungal infections. The fungi are transmitted when people inhale particles found in soil or animal droppings, which then travel to the lungs. From there, these fungal infections are capable of disseminating system-wide through the bloodstream and affecting other organs, such as the liver, spleen, and adrenals, similarly to miliary TB. Now let's start with histoplasma. This fungus is endemic to the states bordering the Ohio River Valley and Mississippi River. Histoplasma is found in bird and bat droppings, so you might suspect histoplasmosis in cave explorers who are frequently exposed to bat droppings. Macrophages will phagocytose histoplasmosis spores, so you can diagnose this fungal infection on biopsy if you see budding yeast found within macrophages, as shown in this picture. Next is Blastomyces. Remember that this fungus is endemic to Mexico and the states east of the Mississippi River. This is the rarest of the fungi to infect humans, but the most severe if you are unfortunate enough to have it. Some of the symptoms in addition to pneumonia that you might see include ulcerating pimples, meningitis, and arthritis. A key to recognizing blastomycosis is seeing what is known as broad-based buds on biopsy, as shown in this picture. This means that the base, where you see one spore budding off of another spore, is broad or wide. This is in contrast to Cryptococcus, a fungal species we'll talk about in the opportunistic fungi section. Cryptococcus has narrow base buds, meaning the base, where one spore buds off of the other, is very narrow, as if it could be pinched off easily. Okay, next is Coccidioides. You'll find this fungus in the southwestern states of the United States, such as California and Arizona. For this reason, this fungal infection has been given various other names, such as the San Joaquin Valley Fever or the Desert Fever. Do you remember which form this fungus exists as at body temperature? Right, as spherules and not as yeast. To be more exact, the fungus exists as several small spores, or endospores, found within a spheral, as shown in this figure here. Coccidiomycosis has been linked to earthquakes in California, which tend to disrupt the soil and throw spores up into the air, where they are inhaled and become spherules in the lungs. The last of the four systemic fungi is Paracoccidioides, which is endemic to Latin America. This fungus has an interesting shape that has been likened to a captain's wheel due to its multiple buds. 
Can you see why in this image? Let's now move on to the cutaneous fungal infections, which affect the skin. The first fungus is Malassezia furfur. This fungus causes tinea versicolor, which presents as hypopigmented pale patches on the skin in darker colored individuals and as hyperpigmented darker patches on fair colored individuals. You will commonly see this fungal infection in the summer months in hot, humid weather. Oftentimes, people will have this condition for some time, but in the summer when people tan under the summer sun, the hypopigmented macules become more easily visible. This makes people come to the doctor after being at the beach for a day or two, thinking that they've developed a rash at the beach, when in fact they simply made a rash that had previously been there more visible. Malassezia furfur contains lipases, which degrade fat in the skin and produce acids that then cause damage to melanocytes. You can diagnose this fungal infection by taking skin scrapings from the patches and applying KOH to the sample. Under a microscope, you will see what is known as the spaghetti and meatball appearance of Malassezia furfur. Here are the spaghetti strands, and here are the meatballs. The Malassezia species is also responsible for dandruff in the hair. This might help you remember why topical selenium sulfide, which you can see in the store as Selsun Blue Shampoo, is helpful in treating dandruff in the hair and tinea versicolor. The next cutaneous fungi are the dermatophytes, which include several fungal species such as Microsporum, Trichophyton, and Epidermophyton. These species are the causative agent of skin infections on various parts of the body because they like to colonize keratinized epithelium in warm, moist areas. Trichophyton is the most common of the dermatophytes. Depending on what body part is involved, the name of the infection is slightly different, but is always preceded by the word tinea. For example, a dermatophyte infection of the foot is tinea pedis, also known as athlete's foot. You have probably heard of a dermatophyte infection of the body, known as tinea corporis, or ringworm. Here is the typical appearance of ringworm, an itchy ring-like lesion that appears to be spreading centrifugally. Now on to the opportunistic fungal infections, which rarely cause symptoms unless the host is immunocompromised. Canada is part of normal skin flora. Factors such as antibiotic or steroid use, cancer, and other immunocompromised states increase the risk of developing a variety of different infections. You may see oral or esophageal thrush, vulval vaginitis, diaper rashes, and endocarditis in IV drug users. Which valve is more likely to be infected by Canada in IV drug users? Right, the tricuspid. And do you remember which gram-negative bacteria we also discussed that can cause endocarditis in IV drug users? Right, that would be Pseudomonas. Some more serious Canada infections can include disseminated candidiasis to other organs, which usually occurs in neutropenic patients, and chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, which, as its name suggests, is characterized by chronic Canada infections of mucocutaneous surfaces, such as skin and nails. This is seen in patients with T-cell immunodeficiencies. On KOH prep, you will see pseudohyphae and budding yeast, which grow at 20 degrees Celsius. When Canada is grown in animal serum at 37 degrees Celsius, you will see germ tubes, which are shown here. These germ tubes are diagnostic for Canada albicans. Aspergillus fumigatus is a fungus that causes various lung diseases in immunocompromised host. It can stimulate an IgE response leading to bronchospasm, known as allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. It may deposit in an existing lung cavity and form an aspergilloma, or fungus ball, which is shown here. Some aspergillus species can produce aflatoxins, which have been linked to hepatocellular carcinoma. And finally, it can invade lung tissue and the bloodstream, leading to blood vessel occlusion and pulmonary infarction, known as invasive aspergillosis. Aspergillus is found in wheat stacks and grows as mold on decaying vegetation, so you may suspect this type of infection in farmers. Its characteristic form is branching septate hyphae, which branch at 45 degrees, so pay attention to the angles here. You may also see aspergillus on step one as a fruiting body, which is shown here. We briefly spoke about cryptococcus before. What is its characteristic shape? That's right, narrow base buds as opposed to blastomyces, which has what type of buds? Yes, broad base buds. 
Cryptococcus is also known for its thick polysaccharide capsule, which it makes it so easily visible under mucicarmine and India ink stains. Now cryptococcal infections can include wound infections, pulmonary cryptococcus, and cryptococcal meningitis. Cryptococcus is a defining opportunistic infection for AIDS. It is found in pigeon and bat droppings and acquired through inhalation, so you may suspect it in a homeless person with AIDS living in the city. Cryptococcus neoformans can be grown on Sabarod's agar and stained with India ink stain. The latex agglutination test is used to diagnose cryptococcus. Basically, you apply latex particles, which are related to anti-cryptococcal antibody, to a patient's blood. If they have a cryptococcal infection, these latex particles will react with cryptococcus's polysaccharide capsular antigen and cause agglutination of the patient's blood. On histopathological examination of the brain, you will see soap bubble lesions or small cyst-like spaces in the gray matter of a patient who had cryptococcal meningitis. Our last opportunistic fungal species is the Rhizopus mucor family. This fungus can often be mistaken for aspergillus, so remember these differences. Rhizopus mucor and aspergillus both have branching hyphae. However, aspergillus has septated hyphae, which just means that they are segmented or divided into sections. Rhizopus mucor is non-septated. Aspergillus branches at how many degrees? Right, 45 degrees, but Rhizopus mucor branches at 90 degrees or more and irregularly. You may see rhizopus mucor infections in diabetic ketoacidotic patients causing mucor mycosis, an infection of the sinuses, lungs, or brain. This is because it thrives in environments with lots of glucose and ketones during an episode of diabetic ketoacidosis. Rhizopus mucor will then proliferate in this environment within the sinuses, enter blood vessels, and spread the cribriform plate into the brain. Look for symptoms such as headache, facial pain, scars on the face, and cranial nerve palsies. People tend to look very sick, so don't expect this in a patient with a slow-growing rash over the course of months. This next fungus, Pneumocystis gyrovecchi, is also an opportunistic infection that is an important cause of interstitial pneumonia seen in AIDS patients. We separated here to highlight the fact that it used to be known as Pneumocystis carini and classified as a protozoan. It is now recognized to be a fungus and was renamed to Pneumocystis gyrovecchi. Keep in mind that you may still see Pneumocystis carini pneumonia, PCP, in older microtext and hear of Pneumocystis gyrovecchi pneumonia still referred to as PCP in the hospital. Because this fungal infection is commonly seen in AIDS patients, or those who are severely immunosuppressed, prophylaxis against pneumocystis gyrovecchi pneumonia is indicated by giving drugs such as TMP-SM Max. In AIDS patients, star prophylaxis when CD4 count drops below 200. Here is a picture of its characteristic disc shape, the yeast form that can be seen with methenamine or silver stain on a lung biopsy sample. Sporothrix shankii causes a subcutaneous infection. It is introduced into the skin, typically via the prick of a rose thorn, so suspected in any question stem mentioning a gardener. Sporothrix can cause a local nodule, which may become necrotic and ulcerate. From there, sporothrix can drain into the lymphatic channels and create satellite lesions as it travels up the arm. And that is it for the fungi that you should know. Next, we'll talk about parasites, which include protozoa and worms.